Technology Club Spring 2020 Quarantine Edition. Um, this is definitely a new quarter for all of us, but I'm really excited and I'm really grateful that you guys decided to join us for this quarter while we're online. Um, I know that we're going to be able to provide you guys with the same content that we would have week to week in club. So I really hope you guys participate with us and I'm really excited for what you guys can learn. So just a quick introduction, I'm Rebecca Oliveira, I'm the current president of Functional Neurology Club and I'm in 10th quarter and I'm from Marietta, Georgia. A quick story about why I'm in functional neurology and how I got into chiropractic is I always knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't know how or what that would look like, which profession. So when I was doing my search, I somehow found myself in a chiropractic office and she told me to go check out Life University. And so on my first visit, I was actually able to go to NeuroLife as well as meet a student who was really involved with the functional neurology club here. And after learning about how chiropractic adjustments as well as functional neurology therapies and that assessment can really allow you to change and improve your, pa your patient's brains and their quality of life. I knew that was something that I had to be a part of. Um, growing up, both of my grandmothers have really advanced Alzheimer's and so if you've ever met anyone with that condition or know a loved one with it, you know how depressing it can be to watch them go through that deterioration as well as go through it with your family. Um, and so I knew that was something that I had to be able to help those populations either prevent that or help them through that condition to at least have, maintain a quality of life. And so I'm really excited to be studying functional neurology and excited for you guys to learn a bit more about it. So here's Rope. Oh, perfect. That was awesome. Thank you. So yeah, my name is Rope Chudenius. I'm a sixth quarter student here at Life University. Uh, I've been an officer at the Neuro Club for six quarters now. So I actually started coming into this club when I was an undergrad here and I learned so much and I've been super grateful to have this opportunity to teach you guys and be around these clubs because it's going to teach you so much. And a little bit about myself, so I'm from Finland, hence the accent, um, and how I got into functional neurology in the first place was through my dad. So my dad's a chiropractor, he, he's a life graduate, and he started doing his uh, functional neurology classes after he graduated, and I've seen a lot of uh, uh, not a lot, but some cases with uh, uh, my dad has been treating, and it's been so interesting to see him use eye movements and use vestibular therapies and adjust patients in different positions with using their eyes, etc. Um, so that kind of um, got my inter interest in it in the first place, and then I got into school, and I was like, oh my god, there's a club, I have to get into that, and it's been a great ride ever since, and hopefully. Um, we can teach you as well as the people before us t uh, taught us. So hopefully it's going to be a good ride. All right, cool. Yep. Thank you. Cool. All righty, guys. So let's get started. And give us some grace with the technology. If it doesn't look as great or anything, this is our first time doing um, it online. So we're just going to do our best this quarter. So just some quick club announcements. Our officers, like I said, Rebecca, Rope, we also have Julie, Nick, and Skyler who um, are gonna be available online throughout the quarter and they might come teach if they come back to Marietta. So hopefully you'll get to see their faces. Our advisor when we're normally on campus is Dr. Federley, who is actually the doctor running NeuroLife right now. And um, if you guys want to DM us or I guess you can't email us without our email, so DM us on Instagram or however, however you found this link to get on our email list so you guys can constantly get the link for our new videos each week as they come out, or follow our Instagram at lifeu underscore FNC to also get the links to these videos and just any updates about our club. For t-shirts and manuals, just contact us if that's something you're interested in for this quarter since we are um, dealing with some just interesting times right now. If you're in Marietta or locally, we might be able to get you one, but otherwise we're just going to save that for our summer quarter. Resources, so like I said, our club manual, if you really want to get more in depth um, into an overview of chiropractic neurology, more than what we're going to talk about here, that's a great resource, as well as the Carrick Institute. Um, Dr. Najib's video is really great for neuroanatomy. You can find him at drnajeeblectures.com. We have a Facebook group called Functional Neurology Club, which has an amazing network of chiropractic, chiropractic doctors who have already graduated, as well as a mix of students who have been a part of our club 
So it's a really cool um, place if you just want more information. Local chiropractic neurologist. So after all of these stay-at-home effects and quarantines are over, I really, really recommend you guys going to find a local chiropractic neurologist back home or in Marietta. We have so many here to really go and shadow and learn how to apply this knowledge that we're going to give you guys. We also have Dr. Esposito's functional neurology class and Dr. Amos's class at school that you can sign up for, as well as us. Hopefully, we will be a resource to you guys and just ask questions. So this is just a basic overview of what we're going to cover each week in club. For now, this is our plan. It may change. We're kind of just being fluid and going with the flow. So just so you guys know what's coming up. And so this is just what we want to cover. This first um, lesson is really just going to be an introduction to functional neurology. So we want to answer what it is. We want to say how it's different. Who can we treat? We want to teach you the fundamentals of functional neurology, really lay that groundwork for you guys. And then we're going to talk about how Har Harvey Lillard got his hearing back using the stuff we learned today. So now we're just going to get into it. What is functional neurology? So I want to go ahead and give credit to Dr. Klotzik, who is the one that really gave me this idea of this definition and helped me to understand it and how to explain it. So I'm just going to read it. Looking at function within the central nervous system by looking at how neuronal networks communicate with one another and how the outcomes from these neuronal networks change through manipulating variables that alter gene response from environmental receptors. So that's kind of a handful. And um, it might seem complicated, but I'm going to break it down for you guys. And so since I'm talking to chiropractic students, I'm going to use this um, definition and break it down using an adjustment. So we're going to replace manipulating variables and add in adjustment. So adjustment is going to become our variable. So when we're performing an adjustment, for an adjustment, we're going to be using the joint mechanoreceptors on the joint that we're adjusting. That is our, those joint mechanoreceptors are our environmental receptors that we're um, altering. And so the stimulus goes into these receptors, and it, at the fundamental level, what we say as chiropractors is our innate response to an adjustment. That change that we're seeing is we're changing, we're changing gene expression. At the smallest level, that's what we're doing with an adjustment, and it's a really powerful thing. And so with functional neurology, we're looking at the central nervous system and assessing it by how the neuronal, neuronal networks communicate with one another. And then once we make a change with those variables, if that communication gets better or worse. So that's really what we're assessing. And these are really just, I think that they're familiar concepts for us in chiropractic school. We talk about that brain-body connection with the safety pin and things like that. And so what I really want to challenge you guys with this quarter is we're going to be throwing maybe some new words at you guys. I know Ropa is going to throw a lot at you guys during this lecture. And so, but I want you to not be afraid of the new vocabulary, but really come to understand it and familiarize yourself with it because we're still talking chiropractic and we're using the same messages and the same stories. We're just explaining it with different words, but they're words that everyone in the healthcare field can understand and use so that we can all learn to communicate better together and really teach people what we do. I think it'll really help our profession. So another thing that I really guys want you guys to understand about functional neurology is we're not a technique club. So if you're a Gonstead doc or you want to use Activator, you want to use Thompson, you already know what technique you want to focus on. Chiropractic is, can, or functional neurology can be used with anything. Um, really what we're doing with functional neurology is we're analyzing our patients and then we're explaining, we're understanding the neuroscience of what those therapies, what the adjustment of the Thompson adjustment or what the activator adjustment or whatever adjustment style that you want to use, what it's doing to your patient, how specifically it's changing their brain. Um, it's really just teaching us what we're doing with the adjustment. We always say that functional neurology is the science behind the art. Um, and it's really just going to also help us as clinicians if you understand functional neurology because you're not only going to understand better maybe where you would adjust or when you would adjust your patient, but more importantly, you're also going to know 
maybe when you would not adjust your patient or when maybe another different therapy is going to be more appropriate for that patient. Um, and so how is functional neurology different than maybe a normal neurologist? I know this is something that gets kind of confusing in chiropractic school when we go through our neurological diagnosis class and we learn a lot of exams that are familiar that we use in functional neurology club, but they're used for different assessment purposes. So for, to explain that, I'm going to use the case of Sidney Crosby. He is a really famous hockey player, if you don't know about him, and he was made a really famous functional neurology patient. He suffered a lot of severe concussions and had significant symptoms and outcomes after this and was really just unable to play hockey and live his life like he could before. And so what, what I want to teach you guys is, so when he went to normal, the normal neurology route, when he went to normal um, neurologists, they did brain scans, MRIs, tests, all that they could do with all of the best medical information that we have. And then when you looked at those MRIs and things like that, they were all normal. There was nothing wrong with him per se, but then when you looked at his symptoms, you knew that that couldn't be the case. There, was, there had to be an explanation. And so luckily, he um, found a functional neurologist and they were able to maybe give him an explanation as to what was going on because we know if a patient is having symptoms, there has to be an explanation, but maybe if a patient doesn't have a a lesion or a problem or a pathology that is so big that you wouldn't see on a normal exam, it might not be picked up or you might be normal um, in the medical community, which it, that's fine. We think that, I think they're really beneficial and amazing at treating what they do with surgery and pathologies and things like that, but we just play a different role for our patients. So we examine the brain by looking at movement. And by movement, I really mean we're looking at brain output. So we're looking at how the, what the nervous system is telling us through the brain output to tell us what's going on with it or maybe where a deficiency might lie. So when we're doing just a normal motor output test, maybe something as simple as this that we're going to teach you guys more about next week, we're going to look at asymmetries between the tests, so maybe between one side and the other, or between one test and a different test to tell us maybe where in the body or where in the brain that specific problem is going on so that we can know where to go and treat it and help our patients fix their symptoms. So usually if a patient has like frontal lobe systems, you might be able to see it with this test and then it can, their symptoms can be explained through the motor deficiencies that they're showing. So it's just a little bit different. So who do we treat with functional neurology? We treat all the way from super healthy and not even healthy, that's as healthy as normal functioning. With elite athletes, we know they wanna get past normal, they wanna get to like superhuman performance. And so functional neurologists can actually help them do that by going past what we know to be optimal or to be healthy and then continually improving their tests and their outcomes to make sure that they're just performing even better than before. Um, also, we can, cheat, we can treat concussion patients, movement disorders, vertigo, autism, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, ADHD. We can also treat anxiety, gut dysfunction patients, and patients with migraines. So the spectrum is huge. We can treat people with serious brain injuries. We can treat people with more mild, just symptomatology that they're experiencing. Um, we can treat people with neurodegenerative or neurocognitive, like learning disabilities and things like that. So um, what I think is really cool about that is no matter what patient population you want to see, if you've already decided your technique and furthermore you know you want to be an activator pediatric doctor, if you know that you want to work with pediatrics, it's still important to understand functional neurology because your babies and your little kids are still going to have brains and nervous systems. So no matter what age they are or what condition anybody walks in with, you're really gonna be able to understand how to specifically look at each patient as an individual, assess their nervous system individually, and because you're not having that cookie cutter approach, you're gonna be more effective and you can be really efficient in the progress that you're giving to your patients. Um, and I just wanna make a note that we're not gonna be saying that we're, um, we're not diagnosing these conditions, and maybe if they have a really ablative lesion, where they can't, um, 
they can't ever regain completely normal function. What's really cool is functional neurologists can still help, the, um, help through neuroplasticity, help their patients to find a compromise or just something that's a little bit different and better to optimize the function that they can have and really help their quality of life to improve with whatever condition they do have. All right, so I'm going to hand it off to Rope to teach you guys about just neuron theory. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to start talking about neuron theory. I consider this like the fundamentals of functional and functional and neurology, really important stuff. And I'm going to throw a lot of different terms and definitions at you. So if you feel overwhelmed or anything, don't worry about it. We're going to keep reintroducing these concepts to you in future club meetings as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. A neuron needs three things to survive. Oxygen, fuel, and stimulation. All these three things are absolutely essential for your overall well-being because we are our neurons, okay? Your brain has to function well for your body to function well. So I'm gonna break these down one by one and talk about why we care about these things as chiropractors and what can we do possibly. So oxygen, why do we need oxygen? Well, obviously every organism out there that uses aerobic metabolism as their way of producing energy or ATP are gonna need oxygen. If you don't get oxygen, you're going to bias anaerobic metabolism that's going to have bad byproducts such as lactic acid and hydrogen ions. And those are, those are not going to be healthy things for your neuron and for that overall system. So what can we do as chiropractors to make sure that our patients are getting enough oxygen? Well, one of the things that you can make sure is that they have proper ribcage mechanics. So when you breathe in, your ribcage is supposed to move and you're supposed to uh, increase your intrathoracic pressure. When that happens, you're going to be able to fill your lungs with oxygen. But if you have a rib subluxation or a misalignment or a fixation or whatever you want to call it, your ribcage is not going to be able to move as well. And then your brain is going to be like, hey man, I'm not getting enough oxygen here. Start breathing faster. And then you start hyperventilating. When you hypervent hyperventilate, you lose more carbon dioxide and you increase the pH, you get more alkaline. And when you get more alkaline, what happens with calcium is that it will bind with albumin and that'll decrease the freely, circul uh, freely circulating amount of calcium in your body. And at the end, your sodium channels will not function as well. And that neuron will need ne less and less stimuli to fire or depolarize because it gets closer and closer, closer to the threshold. And at the end, that neuron is not going to be able to supply the ATP that it needs and the system fails. Okay, so absolutely crucial. What are some of the tests that we can, uh, we can observe and see if our, our patients have enough oxygen? Well, pulse ox. We use pulse, ox, pull, pulse oxes all the time. And then another thing you could do is percussive myotonia reflex. So what we do with that is you tap the patient's thinner eminence like this and the thumb is supposed to move like that. If the patient has a pH problem, or possibly due to not getting enough oxygen and hyperventilation, what you'll see is that when you tap the thinner eminence, they'll get this twitch. Those neurons will fire and fire in those action potentials all the time, and then it will eventually fatigue. Why the, and, and I kind of explained why that happened, is because that those neurons got so close to the threshold that it needed so less stimuli to fire those action potential and they just kept firing and firing. So that's, that's another test for you to, you to see if somebody has a pH problem or possibly you know, a rib subluxation. So we have to fix, we have to adjust those rib subluxations. All right, so then feel. Uh, feel is absolutely important. And we're gonna be talking about this more in the autonomics week, probably in week four or week five. Um, why do we need fuel? Well, obviously we need to give nutrition to these neurons as well. They need glucose, they need blood. Um, according to Blumenfeld, just a fun fact, he says that about 50% of all the pathologies that occur in the, function, in, the, in the nervous system occur because of inefficient blood supply in those areas of the brain or in the uh, nervous system in general. So your fuel delivery is absolutely important because your therapies are not gonna work as well or they might not work at all or you might go past their metabolic capacity because they don't have the fuel delivery in that system to actually supply or 
or react to that demand that you're giving that uh, system. So what we usually do in um, functional neurology or we say or we talk about is that you need to rule out red flags very first, okay? If there's a need for emergency. Next, you need to stabilize their autonomics. Always, always, always. Before you start treating their primary neuraxis, okay? So if a, if a patient has this autonomia, you have to address that issue first before starting doing our other therapies, okay? So then we have stimulation. Stimulation is super crucial, okay? Uh, we know from research, for example, that that has been done with cats. If you deprive, deprive cats from ever walking, what will happen is that they will get blind. So that same, that, that proprioception and that vestibular input in this 1G environment, this gravity that's giving us stress all the time is absolutely important for our overall function of those of our neurons and our body in general. And we know that astronauts in space um, will their IQ will start decreasing and they'll get all these sensory mismatches because they're not getting this gravity and this stress on their spine and on their body that we're so used to. So stimulation is absolutely important and when it comes to our therapies we have to have appropriate stimulation. So you can have too much stimulation or you can have too little stimulation and we want to be somewhere in the middle we can have it in the perfect way as, or in the most efficient way as possible. So what we can do to make sure that we're, we are creating positive neuroplasticity is doing our neuro exams, doing pre and post checks all the time or measuring our autonomics all the time when we're doing our therapies. Super important. All right, so in your patient, you must be able to tell if there's an imbalance in one or more of these uh, three things. And let's jump into the next slide. So receptor-based therapies. In my opinion, this, or this might be the reason why functional neurology is so exciting to me. Uh, it's because you can use all these different receptor-based modalities to create neuroplasticity in somebody's brain and their overall health will change. So some of the most common things we use is eye movement therapies. We use vestibular proprioception. Uh, we use temperature, touch, vibration, taste, smell, auditory input. As long as you know how all these receptors fire into the brain and what kind of essential change you're expecting to happen from these therapies, you can do so much, so, so, so much. And I think it's so um, exciting because the moment your patient walks into your office, your therapies will start, okay? You're gonna start stimulating their nervous system immediately. And whether your the color of your walls is blue or red or white, it's gonna make a huge difference. Or if you're gonna talk to your patient on their left side of their body or they're on their right side, what kind of words are you saying? What words, what words are you using when you're adjusting your patient? We know that certain words activate different areas of the cortex. We know that if you have different smells or essential oils on you, those might change, um, affect the patient as well. So your, your therapy will, will become endless. And everything that you do is basically a therapy because whatever, whatever you encounter in your environment is based off of these receptors that create essential central integration and creates your reality, okay? So let's start talking about how we can use these receptor-based therapies in different ways. So temporal versus spatial summation. Um, so temporal summation is, these are supposed to be neurons here. So for example, with temporal summation, we increase the frequency of firing of those neurons or that pathway over time. So for example, what could I do is I could adjust somebody's fingers and then I could come into the ipsilateral elbow and then to the shoulder and then to the cervicals. So I'm kind of adding layers of stimulation over top of, top of each other. And you can kind of see it being demonstrated here. Or then you could do spatial summation, which is kind of my favorite over these two. Um, what you do with spatial summation is let's say, let's say you're adjusting a patient and you're adjusting their C3, for example, on the left. And you wanna increase the activation into those neuronal pools even more. You wanna add a little bit more oomph into that, into that system or that pathway. What you can do is you can activate the system with any other receptor, receptor on that same side of the body. For example, you could do vibration on their neck at the same time, or you could have them move their eyes in different direction when you're adjusting them. Having your eyes up and to the left 
is going to stimulate this left cerebellum more than having your eyes on up and to the right. Okay, so you can increase the frequency of firing and the spatial summation of these neurons with one adjustment, and this makes the this makes all the difference. Uh, I've seen my dad, who's a, who's a chiropractor as well, done this multiple, multiple times. He's always playing with different eye movements, with adjusting, and it, I, I can tell you it makes all the difference. Okay, so super exciting stuff. So then subluxation and diastasis. Uh, we, our favorite word, subluxation, obviously. Um, a lot of people have different definitions on what is, what is a subluxation and what is not a subluxation. Um, I don't think I have the best definition to you either, but what we what we know is that it's not a bone on a nerve. Okay, if that was the case, we would be only treating radiculopathies as chiropractors. So we know that subluxation will deprive the brain from afferent information. So in a subluxation, you usually lose a few degrees of motion or some degrees of motion, and then that you don't feed that cerebellum with all the afferent information, and that cerebellum won't fire to the brain into the right cortex as well and by time you, you start losing the map of that joint in your in your in your brain so you have a map of everything you have a visual map you have an auditory map you have a map for your own body in your brain and those maps all abs maps are absolutely crucial for your survival and for you to be able to um, move in the environment and to survive okay so in a subluxation we always talk about muscle spindles and gto's and mechanoreceptors etc so when you lose uh, degrees of motion, that muscle, those muscle spindles are not going to be feeding the brain with all the afferent information and proprioception it needs. Like we talked about earlier with stimulation, stimulation <clears throat> is absolutely crucial. So subluxation is depriving your nervous system from that stimulation. You get disafferentation, okay? And we have a concept here or a term called diastasis. What diastasis is, is a dysfunction in one area of the, of the brain due to a pathology in another area of the brain. <clears throat> and there's a really strong connection from the left cerebellum to the right cortex, and same thing, right cerebellum to the left cortex. And we know that if you get a lot of subluxations, or if you have certain uh, chronic subluxations, let's say you have it on the left side of your cervicals, that might deprive the cerebellum from the afferent information that it feeds off all that proprioception and then that communication from the cerebellum to the contralateral cortex decreases as well and then you get diastasis and you get these frontal lobe findings or these right cortical findings okay <clears throat> so we need to be able to address this bilaterality because we know that as humans we have the most lateralized brains out there in, out of any any animal okay so that's just the concept you can go read about diastasis there's a lot of research on it uh, which is something we have to appreciate and uh, uh, use that in our therapies as well. So then <clears throat> let's go to seven levels of lesion. Um, this is really helpful, kind of putting things into or organizing, organizing your thought process a little bit. Uh, it's going to help you in your diagnostic classes as well a lot. Um, how we use it is that let's say a patient comes in with a, a certain primary symptom. We start thinking about, first of all, well, is that primary symptom coming, uh, is the root cause because we have an in organ or receptor lesion or a pathology or a problem? Could it be something in the fascia, scar tissue? Are those receptors damaged? Is there something like that happening? If not, then we go to the peripheral nerve, nerve root. Is there inflammation of the nerve root? Is there a lower motor neuron injury that's causing this primary symptom? Whatever it might be. If not, we go ahead and jump into the spinal cord. Well, do they have a spinal cord injury? Do they have an upper motor neuron, neuron lesion? Or is the integration in the spinal cord not working correctly? And that's causing their symptoms. Is there, a, is there an issue with the brainstem? We talk about the brainstem a lot in basic club and in advanced club especially. So brainstem is the most primitive part of our brain. So we have a couple of rules in, in our club that we use and we say that the more lateral and the higher the area of the brain is, the newer that area of the brain is. So such as the frontal lobes, the newest part of our brain. But then the lower and the more midline the structure in your brain is, the more primitive that structure is, such as the brainstem. 
and we know that these higher or these newer areas of the brain inhibit the more primitive parts of the brain. So we talk about this top um, top down regulation and bottom up development, and we're going to be talking about that more in the future as well. <clears throat> but then, so you have to consider: well, do we have a do we have a problem or a pathology or a dysfunction in any of the areas of the brainstem, the mesencephalon, the pons, or the medulla? Then we go to the cerebellum. Well, is there a problem in the cerebellum that's causing this primary symptom? The cerebellum has to do with accuracy, balance, and coordination of movement. Could, could that be the issue? Very possible. Thalamus, par primary relay center of the brain. Is there an is issue there? Or could it be basal ganglia not inhibiting certain things? Could it be the cortex, right? So you start seeing how we start adding these layers and your thought process gets more clear and organizing and start thinking about all these different structures and how these structure act structures actually play a role to each other and how they activate each other and their con connections, okay? We're gonna have one week just for the cortex, so we're gonna divide all or the lobes of the brain and we're gonna talk about how to test them and what kind of see with what, what to see if there's a pathology or dysfunction in those areas of the brain, okay? All right, so central integrated state. Central integrated state, uh, basically what it means is that it's a, sum, it's a sum of all excitatory and inhibitory inputs into a one neuron or neuronal pool, okay? So that's gonna determine how close, your, how, how close to a threshold your neuron is. And at any given moment, your, your central integrated state might change depending on what kind of stimuli you're getting from your environment blue lights, uh, colors of the walls around here, is it sunny outside, etc., etc. Um, what we're trying to demonstrate here is that your brain's central integrated state is going to determine your reality, your perception of reality. We know that all sensory stimuli that comes into your brain is at all times simplified just to overcome the functional overload of everything that you could possibly take from the environment. Okay, so we have to simplify all the sensory information information that's coming in. Otherwise, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be as efficient uh, using our brain for more primitive and more um, important aspects of function. Okay, so here, what I want you to do <clears throat> is I want you to look at box number A and then look at box number B. Which box do you think appears more dark? Okay, is there a difference in the color? And this is kind of a cool, uh, I think we got this originally from Dr. Heidi Havik's book, but I don't know where, who came up with this originally, but it's kind of like a brain trick. And it's kind of, it's showing you that your brain is creating your own reality, your perception of the world at all times. So when I add some layers in here, you start noticing that, oops, you start noticing that these two boxes are the same color. For me, when I first saw this, I totally thought that B would look darker. And the reason for that is because that B is under a shade and your brain has an understanding or it has a, it, it has a program or it, it knows that whatever is under a shade will appear more dark. And you have that simplification in your brain just to make everything more efficient. But here we see that they're actually the same color. So your central integrated state, for state of your neurons are gonna determine how you see the world around you. And this is huge, for example, in depression and anxiety and all these different um, disorders. All right, so here are some of the really important uh, things that we need to talk about. So oculomotor system, vestibular system, and proprioceptive system all play a role, all pl uh, fire into the sensory integrators in the brain to create a motor output, which is movement or posture. And we talk about movement and posture a lot as chiropractors, okay? Why, do they, why did they have a head tilt? Why did they have a high shoulder? Why is there an ilium moved, okay? So all these three things play a role into your posture more than you could ever think. And we talk about 
mainly about the, uh, the function of the spine and how it's moving, etc. But we need to consider how the oculomotor, the vestibular system, and the proprioceptive, proprioceptive system are all, all firing into this multimodal polysensory system to create this certain motor output. So oculomotor system, we deal a lot with eye movements and looking at the dynamics of it. So I'll give you an example. Um, we, we move our eyes every day thousands and thousands and thousands of times. We call this saccades, moving from one target to another. So me, me just moving my eyes here and here and here, I've done that thousands of times every day. If you have a faulty saccade system, you're not able to generate that eye movement accurately or it's not getting enough power or choose to move your eyes to certain certain position, you're gonna have to compensate with something else. And usually the compensation is your musculoskeletal system. Okay, so let's say I couldn't saccade, I couldn't move my eyes to the left in a ballistic fast way. Well, what will happen is my neck will compensate for that. Every time I wanna move my eyes to the left, my neck will have to help me out. And imagine doing thousands of saccades every day and you have to activate your neck every freaking time you move your eyes, that's gonna cause a lot of stress. So a patient might walk into your office with neck pain and you're gonna be like, oh, they have a listing on the left, PLS, let's fix that, boom. They feel better um, after the adjustment, but they come back week after week after week, coming that, hey, the neck pain came back. What if you could look at the saccade system and rehabilitate that part of the brain that's responsible of moving your eyes to the left? And then now that they move their eyes to the left, they don't have to activate their, le their neck anymore. They can just move their eyes. Huge, huge system. And that's just one example how that might play a role into your spine and into your other uh, musculoskeletal system. So then vestibular system. Uh, we're gonna have two weeks, two weeks just for the vestibular system because it's so important. Uh, we evolved in this 1G environment, in this gravity, and pretty much every other sensory system is dependent on this gravity sensation. So vestibular system, originally we got it from, from evolution from fish. It's the lateral, lateral line system, okay? So it's that primitive. And the vestibular system will give us the perception or it will tell us where we are in space, where our head is moving in space, and where is the world around us, okay? With the parietal lobe. Um, if the vestibular system is not working correctly, we know that it will, we know that it has direct connection to the spine. So we usually say that uh, information from the vestibular apparatus, a huge portion of that information or that firing will go to the eyes and another huge amount of that information goes into your spine to activate your intrinsic musculature in your spine. And we know that those are not volitional muscles. So let's say you have a, you have a mismatch in your vestibular system. It's firing too much or it's firing too little. And it's firing into those spinal musculature and those intrinsic musculature telling your, telling your body that, hey, we're, for example, we're spinning this way or the world is actually here. That's gonna cause a lot of stress and that's gonna cause activation of those muscles when we didn't want that to happen. So what if you could fix the vestibular system so that those muscles don't have to be tonically fired all the time. And then you, when you adjust those patients, your adjustments will actually hold, okay? That's just one example. We could talk about this all day long. And then proprioceptive system. Uh, I feel like we're pretty good at that as chiropractors, um, but there's so much more to do with it. Uh, when we have our cerebellar lecture, we're gonna be talking about more of it and it plays a huge role into, into the sensory integrators and it plays a role together with the oculomotor and vestibular system. We have to understand that they, they work together. They're not individual systems per se, okay? And all this information comes in and it's integrated in the brain and hopefully that integration was accurate. Hopefully there wasn't any errors from any of these three systems and we can create proper movement and posture, okay? Let's continue. All right, so here we have a term called hemisphericity. It's an important concept to understand. Uh, everyone's probably seen these left brain versus right brain pictures. Um, hemisphericity ta uh, is talking about the fact that you have one, one hemisphere over the other is firing too much or the other one is firing too low. 
okay? Usually we talk about when you talk about hemisphericity is that you have one hemisphere firing less than the other, okay? So it could be a left hemisphere and this could be a right hemisphere, for example. But we know that we can bias our treatments to certain hemi to one hemisphere over the other a lot and we like to utilize that in our therapies a lot as well. So just a little bit about hemisphericity and what the left brain versus the right brain does. So the left brain is more, the more logical, the more, more detailed oriented brain and the right brain is more this big picture, art, music kind of brain, okay? Um, one kind of cool test that you can, you can test with your friends or your patients is um, have them recite numbers. And how you wanna recite those numbers, there's gonna be two different ways you're gonna do it. So you're gonna tell the patient, repeat after me, you're gonna say uh, 404367. And then the patient might be able to say that or not. And then you go like, okay, re repeat after me, 368125. And the difference, difference between those two is that the, the latter one was, I said it with fluctuations, and that's more of a right brain, right brain stimulation versus the other, other one is, was really monotone, okay? So you can kind of determine whether that patient is doing better on the left brain or in the right brain. And you can also use that as a therapy. Anything that you test, you can also use as a therapy, okay? So this is one cool example how you can kind of determine. But we're gonna talk about this a lot more in lobes of the brain next week, okay? All right, so here we have a term called neuroplasticity. We all know this, and it's, it's a really dear thing to us as chiropractors, because we know, for example, Dr. Heidi Havik's research, that chiropractic adjustments are creating positive, positive neuroplasticity, speci specifically in the prefrontal cortex. And we know that the prefrontal cortex is kind of like the conductor of the brain. It's making sure that all these other areas of the brain are functioning well, and everything is going accordingly, okay? It's just kind of like the CEO of the brain. So it's absolutely uh, fascinating and uh, exciting that as chiropractors, we can show that to our patient that from uh, neuroscience tells us that we are creating positive neuroplasticity in your brain. And that's gonna, that's gonna affect your health in such a good way, okay? So this is just a video showing you neurons forming new connections. So what neuroplasticity is, is, is just your neurons being able to adapt to your environment to make new connections. And for the longest time, we thought that that's not possible, that's only possible in, in development in kids. But we now know that neuroplasticity happens throughout your whole life. And with functional neurology, we're able to create so much positive neuroplasticity that it's very exciting. And the patients you're gonna see are are gonna, their lives are gonna be changed because you, you are gonna be able to help them in a way that nobody else was able to help them. Okay, perfect. So let, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So then we have this basic loop that we always talk about and we start, we're gonna start filling, these, filling more structures into this loop as we go on this quarter. So what are, let's say, let's say I move my hand on here on my right side. I know that my left cortex, my left motor strip was responsible of firing into that arm and creating that movement pattern. And also my right cerebellum was activated. Same way, let's say somebody touch my, touches my right, or I touch my right arm, I get this sensory information into my right cerebellum and into the left cortex. So whatever I do here on my right side of my body is getting integrated in my right cerebellum and then it crosses over to the left cortex, the contralateral cortex, same thing goes with this side of the body. So uh, we have this basic loop called a cerebello, meso, thalamo, cortico, panto, cerebello. And that loop fires to about 10 to 15 times before you even moved your hand. So if I wanna pick up something, something on this table, for example, before I even move my hand, that loop fired 10 to 15 times to make sure that everything that you do, that whole movement, will be smooth, accurate, and you have a balanced core, and it's coordinated, okay? So we can play with that loop a lot within our therapies, and we're gonna go really a lot deeper into that loop in our advanced club, and in our basic club as well, because we're gonna tie it into autonomics, 
we're going to tie it up into different aspects of the brain, of the cortex, etc., etc. Okay, so we're going to have a little breakout just to test this, um, this connection that we have. And we're going to do the classic cerebellar test. We're going to have the rock, chop, club test. And then we're going to do rapid alternating movements looking for this diadokinesia, which is the positive for, we're going to explain it just in a bit. And uh, if you want to do this at home, just break out with your, with your friend, your, you know, your partner, <laughs> exactly, your current team buddy. If you want to do that, go ahead. That would be awesome. And I'm going to do it with Rebecca right now. So you guys get to see what it looks like. And I'm going to tell you what you're looking for, what kind of signs. If, which would uh, indicate a dis decreased function on one side or the other. Okay, so what I want you to do, Rebecca, is go ahead and place your arms like this and do pronation, supination as fast as you can. And this is the rapid alternating movement. We're looking for off-axis movements, slowness, and hesitations. And you want to make sure, thank you, you can thanks, uh, make, sh make sure if the, the patient is going all the way pronation and supination that they're not doing this, okay? So have them really use full range of motion and see if you can see any of these things in the movement. Perfect. So now can I, can I um, have you do this? Rock, chop, club, and then start doing it faster. Well, it looks pretty good to me. Okay, go ahead and do the other one. Pretty good as well, maybe not as good on the left. And also what you want to be looking for is facial expression. Are they, trying, are they leaning on one side or the other? Etc. Because you're looking by for bilateral movement. Is it the same same symmetrically on the left to the right? Okay. So we're trying to come up with this axis. Is it decreased firing the right cerebellum or left, and their connection to the frontal lobe and back back to the cerebellum? Okay. So what we saw from here, I thought she had more off axis movement on the rapid alternating movements on the right side, and a little bit worse on the left. But I, w I didn't think it was anything that bad. She was just showing off. She was so fast. Um, but overall, it looked pretty good. But from this, I would probably do a couple more cerebellar tests to make sure that I'm looking at this, that the right neuraxis here. But what I could do is, let's say she has decreased function on her right cerebellum and the left frontal lobe. I could activate that system a little bit more by doing a complex movement called a figure eight. This is what your cerebellum loves a lot. It takes a lot of afferent information, and that's going to fire really strong in the cerebellum and the, the contralateral frontal lobe. Cool. And then we would retest if we created any neuroplasticity in that system and see if it's better. Okay, go ahead and do your rapid alternating movements. Okay, thank you. You might see a change, a positive change. You might see a negative change. Okay, either way you see, you have to think about, okay, did I fire the system too much? Did I fire too little? Or that, was that not the appropriate stimulation for this patient? So that's how you kind of have to go with it. And then you keep adding more layers to your neuro test, and we're gonna teach you so many more tests, okay? And once you have all these tests together, you can use them. And once you have the big big picture of what's going on in that patient, you can your treatments become much easier as well, okay? So then uh, I'm gonna give the stage to Rebecca. Uh, she's gonna be talking about a patient case, the really famous one. <laughs> Alrighty, so. What I'm going to be doing is basically using all of this great vocabulary that Rope taught us tonight um, to basically apply it to a chiropractic case that we should all be pretty familiar with. So I'm going to go over the Harvey Lillard story and hopefully explain what happened neurologically or how can we explain how he got his hearing back. So just a quick recap, Dr. D.D. Palmer adjusted Harvey Lillard who um, was a janitor at a school who before didn't have hearing. That's about as much as we know. And then after his adjustment, it is said that he miraculously got his hearing back thanks to innate. So we're going to take it a little bit further using our seven levels of a lesion to see if we can find out where in the pathways or where in the lesion, <laughs> where in the levels, sorry, um, his lesion was so we can explain where his hearing went wrong. So let's start at the end and go with the end organ. So the organ of cordy inside of the inner ear. Does anyone know of a chiropractic adjustment that can go and specifically stimulate the organ of cordy? So maybe that was the issue and the organ of cordy, his end organ was a problem getting stimulation, getting sound into his brain. 
There's not a nerve. There's nothing that goes th directly there. So we know it's not his end organ. Is there a peripheral nerve lesion? So is there an adjustment that we know of that could explain cranial nerve 8 being the cause of his lesion? Is there an adjustment that specifically goes and only affects cranial nerve 8 to create or to allow um, Harvey Lillard to get his hearing back? The answer is again no. And so that leaves us with within the levels the central nervous system. So let's explain what happened. Harvey had a subluxation. So like Rope talked about, we know that when we have a subluxation, what that really means is the proprioception or the afferent information that's coming in from our spine into our central nervous system is not very good. We have some dysfunction and discommunication going on. So his postural muscles in that area that he was adjusted were not providing enough feedback into his brain. So his brain didn't really know what was going on with the world, so it was hard to perceive anything coming from the world. So the overall central integrated state of his brain, we can say, was lowered or decreased because not normal stimulation of sound was not enough to excite the cortex of his brain to process that and allow him to hear. So then when Dr. DD gave Harvey the adjustment, it caused this barrage of neurons to fire into his brain. So there was a summation of neurons that went into his nervous system from the adjustment, which reset the neurons that provide feedback in the brain. So we reset the proprioception at the level that was adjusted so that adequate information could come from the spine into the brain so that his brain could perceive what was going on. And we basically reset the threshold of what it took for his brain to fire the neurons that have to do with, in, with um, incoming and processing sound for us to know when we're hearing something. So after the adjustment, we can say that the central integrated state of his brain increased because when before a normal sound wasn't enough, a normal sound was finally enough after the adjustment, enough stimulation to fire the neurons in his cortex to process the sound that was coming into his ears and he could finally hear. So that was really exciting. But this is just a different take on what I want you guys to understand the overall picture of what we're doing here. So it's a story that we all knew and we always knew that innate did it and that was the end of the story for the most part. And so I want you guys to be able to learn the neuroscience and learn, just be comfortable learning the neurology. As chiropractors, we're gonna be doctors of neurology, that what we, that's what we say all the time, we're doctors of the nervous system. So I want this to be normal language for us. I want us to be comfortable explaining to our patients what is going on in their nervous system and how we're really making these changes in their brains and their bodies so that they can be just as excited about what's happening. And the answer to how did you do that isn't just, I don't know, or I removed a subluxation. Um, I think it'll be really exciting and it'll really help us to understand research coming out and just make us better physicians overall. So if you guys have any questions, since we're not doing this live, we can't really take them, but feel free to comment or DM or DM us on our Instagram, or you can find us on Facebook, or if you have any of the officers, any of our information, you're more than welcome to reach out to us personally, and we will do our very best to get back to you guys with any questions you guys have. Um, we really appreciate you guys listening, if you've made it this far in our video. Um, and thank you for bearing with us through our first tri trial run of this online video neuro club thing. I'm really excited for this quarter because I think something that is really cool about functional neurology in particular and why this is a great quarter more than ever to be involved with our club is since it really stinks as chiropractic students and future chiropractors were so hands on and we love having that experience and that learning style. But right now, we can't really because of just the circumstances we're in. So I think that this is a perfect quarter. With functional neurology, most of the stuff that we teach in club, there's a little interaction, but for the most part, we can still teach you all, all of our information so that you guys can really take the time this quarter to dedicate yourself and learn more about the nervous system. And then once we get back to club, we're gonna try to do way more hands-on and applying the knowledge that we hope you guys are learning this quarter. Um, 
So while you can't go to your favorite technique clubs, maybe this quarter I really hope you take this time instead to learn more about the nervous system and really become the doctor of the nervous system. Mm -hmm.